Well, now is the part of the meeting that we're going to turn it over to the floor and uh, we'll be starting with questions, um, if there are any, and then we'll move on to brief contributions. The speakers have kept amazingly to time, which is absolutely wonderful of, of all of them. Um, there's just one thing that I want to uh, really raise before I do uh, ask uh, who would like to come in first. And that is that uh, we have got some steel jobs here in Kfili that uh, not everyone is all that aware of. Because Katnix down the road by the roundabout, uh, by the Corbett's roundabout, is Tata owned. Uh, they had their meeting last night to hear from management what was going to happen from them. We're lucky enough to have a uh, very good trade unionist that I certainly know about uh, over 25 years, I hate to say, um, who's been in there all the time and who's uh, letting us know what's going on. And uh, what he says is they're being told their jobs are safe, but that the plant is moving to the Brad. Now, as uh, one very good trade unionist pointed out the other day, if the plant is moving to the Brad, how come it hasn't been built yet? And if it hasn't been built, then what kind of move is that? Uh, so I think that we have to realize that, like a lot of things, like this proposed management buyout, we may be being strung along here. And we may need to make a, a sharp turn to supporting not only all the steel jobs, which we should all be doing, but also, um, very particularly, that plant where hundreds of Philly workers are employed as well. And so we need to get that information out. So if everyone brings that to their trade union, that'll be, that'll be contributions. And I will say, it'll be fantastic to have contributions uh, remembering and celebrating Bob Crow. And I know that there's uh, at least one person in this room who was part of a struggle with me that uh, Bob Crow uh, basically uh, saved our necks and was uh, absolutely uh, uh, a hero to all of us uh, for doing. But um, I hope you'll also come in on how we're going to build the campaign to, to save the steel industry. So, who'd like to come in first? All right, I'm starting off with. Thank you very much. Just a small contribution on the steel industry. When you talk about temporary nationalisation, it's like offering a crutch from a man with a broken leg. Once it's better, we move on. It's not going to be as simple as that as it had in the steel industry. It's a long, long problem with industry and it needs to be nationalised and it needs to be looked at and it needs to be brought together with all the other industries in the country. You can bring it in for the trade of question, because people talk about procurement. But procurement we mean that we would need would come from all the trains and all the other things that have been sent abroad and no longer manufactured in Britain. And the people who work for trade could be absorbed and used for making those, those things that would be used in industry. And it's all part of the question of nationalisation as a planned economy. Short and sweet, that's it. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Hi, um, I'm Jamie. I'm um, an active member of the Baker's uh, F Food and Allied Workers Union and you Fight for Jobs. I'm also standing in the Assembly Elections for Tusk um, to put, uh, you know, uh, to really try and counter UKIP and put the case uh, on the doorsteps for the nationalisation of the steel industry, really get that demand popularised, as well as, you know, to fight the uh, attacks on our trade union rights, the trade union bill. Uh, and so forth. But I wanted to report on uh, the work I've been doing in my union with uh, You Fight for Jobs as well. Um, we've been taking the fight to the fast food bosses mainly, not just the fast food bosses, but you know the government as well with the uh, meagre seven pound twenty an hour living wage, which we say isn't enough to uh, live on in the first place. And why should and the twenty fives be excluded from that? Um, so we've been taking that demand to the streets, we've been having demonstrations up and down the country, uh, lots in Cardiff as well, we've had a few demos in Cardiff, been very successful, had great speakers that there as well. Um, and we've been linking into the international movement as well, uh, for fast food rights, which uh, started in America but has spread really across the world, and we've been um, linking into international days of action, um, demanding rights in the fast food industries, the right to organise in trade unions, uh, the right to a real living wage. We call for £10 an hour in the UK as a, an actual living wage and we say to people who doubt that figure, well if we can't win £10 an hour in Britain, why not when they won $15 an hour in some parts of the United States in Seattle, in the belly of the beast of uh, international capitalism? Why is that demand so far-fetched? 
And the Tories say we can have it by 2020, but we say by then the cost of living will have risen far above that anyway, and it wouldn't be a real living wage. So we demand it now, and we also demand um, an end to zero contracts, um, which we have actually won quite a big victory um, recently. McDonald's has um, said that they're going to approach their workers now with more solidly fixed 4 hour, 16 hour and 30 hour uh, contracts. Um, but that really is just a start. You know, we don't want just um, uh, uh, 30 hour contracts for workers, we want um, rights on those contracts, um, that, you know, rights to decent holiday pay, right to union representation, and we want everyone to be able to have a, a wage they can, they can live off. We say it's absolutely rubbish that um, the under 25s have less responsibilities in life than the, um, the over 25s. There's a lot of workers under the age of 25 that would like to have an independent lifestyle and start a family. Um, so that's uh, the, one of the main parts of, of that demand for £10 an hour as well, is no age exemptions. And we'll be fighting for that as well on the doors um, the Trade Union Socialist Coalition will in the election. I'd just like to finish by saying, you know, we're here tonight, uh, like the speakers have said, not to just remember uh, Bob Crow, but to learn the lessons from all those struggles we fought with Bob um, and to apply them to the future. And I think Bob would support the call for a 24-hour general strike um, across Britain at the present time because as Rob said and some of the other speakers as well, this government is split and divided. You've got backbench calling for an exit in the, in the EU and you've got the front bench calling to remain in. You've got the ex uh, massive exposure of the tax um, dodging they've been doing recently and you've got workers out striking, um, well workers having strike in the PCS, you've got steel workers, uh, the steel crisis, and you've got loads of other disputes being uh, fought. If we link strikes up, we could bring this government down. I'm really, I'm really keen to give the contribution short so as many can come in. Who'd like to come in next? Uh, Yahya, and then, yes. Yahya, please. Hi, Cambridge. Uh, I'm Yahya al the CWU representative and the liaison officer at MGUT for the General Federation of Free Workers Trade Unions in Saudi Arabia. It's needless to say, comrades, to say or mention what Bob Crow has done for me and my family when he made it loud and clear to Theresa May and the Home Office and the Immigration Office as well at the same time when he said we don't feel sorry for Yahya and his family if he's going to, deported, to be deported, but we feel sorry for Theresa May and the Home Office if they decide to do so. <laughs> that was clear. She understood the message immediately. Within two weeks, I had my permanent leave to stay with my family. <laughs> That's what Bob Crow has done for me and my family, and I don't think it's just me who missed him, although he has done much more things for me and my friends more than anybody else, maybe. But still, we need some more genuine trade unionist leaders like him. Now, having said that, comrades, I think while we are really concerned about how much we need to renationalize all industries to be fully want by the working class, not the feudalists and the capitalists of this world. We have to think as well, we should hit hard wherever we can hit. Now, I mean wherever we can hit in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in South Africa, in Tajikistan, we are all in one basket here. If they manage to hit us all without any differentiation between who we are, where we come, what our nationalities, what car skin we have, we have, we will end up with nothing and we will be destroyed in all this world. Now I think of it and I insist, uh, I insist that we should see what we can do with the yellow trade union movements in the Arab world. We should have put some kind of program in place how we are going to fight the yellow trade unionists in the Arab world. And here I go and thank you for giving me the chance and for my
Laura Paylard. I am the president of the PCS sculpture sector. We represent the museums. I'm also from Merseyside Trade Council, so it's great to be, uh, to be at the Trade Council. I mean, first of all, I'm shocked to hear that Leon has passed away. Uh, he was a 30-year-old RMT rep, and he was really inspired by Bob, and certainly in conversation I had with him, you know, Bob was a model that kept him going and, you know, gave him the, the inspiration. And I think that's one of Bob's legacies by inspiring a lot of young trade unionists. You know, get off your knees, be bold, you know, not afraid of using strike uh, as, as, as a weapon. And certainly uh, for workers in my sector, in the museum sector, that boldness has been an inspiration. In the National Gallery, you know, workers took 111 days of strike action last year. We never thought this was possible, and really sad that Bob wasn't able to come to our picket lines and to see that. Uh, we had like 300 people on our picket lines, and we were afraid to already break the existing trade union laws. And, and this type of boldness has in turn inspired Scottish museum workers and Welsh museum workers, and I want to say that, you know, pay tribute to them, because it's been a dispute going on for two years now. It's the lowest paid people who are paying, They've had a number of strikes, I mean, they've coordinated with our empty bus driver in Swansea, which was really good uh, a few months ago. But next week, okay, Cardiff, sorry, it was Swansea as well, maybe? No, just Cardiff, anyway. Um, and uh, next week, they are escalating their dispute. So already they were planning strikes every weekend. From next week, they are adding on. So they'll be on strike every site between Thursday and Sunday. So hopefully, some of you can visit their, their picket either at Big Pit or in, in, in Cardiff, Catus Park. Um, and I think just to conclude on that, I think that it's only this boldness and solidarity that is going to change things and you know, give us the confidence as working class people that we can win again. Thanks. Um, I just have a, a, a question really. I feel a lot of anger both in the workplace and within the community in which I live, um, the Panama, all the cuts that we're having. Just had a big demonstration in London, 150,000 people. But I'm curious as to why that wasn't bigger. The anger that I'm feeling, both myself or with other people, how can we try to galvanise both the, the trade unions, but also people that are losing the services, to try and coordinate that and and, and make a force for change. So an interesting question. If I could just say, um, we're going to call, we're going to ask any of the speakers who want to to reply briefly at the end. So if anyone wants to come in on this, uh, will. So I'm sure there will be a reply. Uh, other contributions? Ah, Tony. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd just like to say a few words. Um, the importance of steel. Can I just ask for a show of hands, who remembers coal fires at home? Just about everybody. Okay, great. But we are a very lucky nation. We lost the coal industry, but we found a substitute. Gas. And pretty much, it is better than coal. You switch on, the house warms up. But the one thing that brings us here today is steel. <coughs> Have we got a substitute for steel? No. We have to keep the industry alive, don't we? Yeah. Can't use plastic, can't use rubber. Can't have plastic coins. Now, we don't mind giving the old rubber check to the Tories. That's all right, right? But I can't stress enough how important it is to have steel. The panel has spoken tonight, we have spoken. But what's that one thing that stands between us all? We can't get away from it. It's that camera there, it's made out of metal. The tripod, made out of metal, it's everywhere we go. There is no substitute. Once we've lost it, we have lost it. We are going to be in dire straits. 15 years ago, there was a uh, steelworks in Ponta Pool. That's gone. They closed it down everywhere. We have to keep the industry alive. In future, if we wish to make the steelworks, we won't be able to. It takes steel. I'll go back to the gas. It's a continuous flow. It's some degrees better than coal. But steel, at the moment, it trickles along. It goes from one plant to another. Steel slabs are 60 ton. 
I've seen steel slabs loaded onto ships in Cardiff and coming off, whichever way you get it, but it takes hours and hours and hours. When we ask for steel from abroad, that's where it's going to come from eventually. It's not like going to uh, the drive through You can't order it, buy it and use it. It comes from Australia and all these places. So it takes time to make it, to load it, to ship it, to unload it. But also, how much can we get on a ship? It's 60 ton, 70 ton for one ingot. We're not looking at much coming in, are we? We as consumers, if we haven't got what we want in the shop, well, we'll go back next week, next month. But the manufacturers, they need a continuous supply. So have a think about that. And also, when it does come into the country, the predicaments we get with unloading. Well, you know, we can't just get a ship into the docks in rough weather. So for that crucial manufacturer that wants it, his supply chain is cut off. It's nothing like steel. It's not, sorry, nothing like gas. And look at the head. This is not today's battle as well, but look at the head to the farming industry. The Tories and the governments are trying their best to nationalise the farming industry. Mm -hmm. One owner. When they succeed, they sell it off for a pound. So we're going to lose the whole farming industry. Let's all get together. Thank you. Idea of how many more want to come in? Uh, okay, so Dave first, then Captain. Thanks, Mary. My, my name is Dave Reed. I'm a member of Unite and I'm Secretary of Socialist Party Wales. Um, I just thought it struck me that um, it might appear strange, but there's a real connection between the contribution made by Jamie about young workers in the fast food industry and all the points being made about the steel industry. Because the, the kind of industries that a lot of young people are working in today, where they're working on zero hour contracts, on the lowest pay possible that the employers can get away with, is an indication of what the future will hold if we don't succeed in fighting for the steel industry. Oh, yeah. Because one of the things about the steel industry, because of the conditions that past generations of workers have fought for, they have maintained well-paid, good quality jobs over a period of time. And what's a threat is not just all communities, it's the whole levels that have been maintained by the British Trade Union movement as the employers go for deregulated, unorganised, casual work where people are, are like um, um, uh, travellers going from job to job, sometimes two or three jobs at the same time, looking for hourly work. This week, Uber is starting up in Cardiff, where you're going to have drivers who are going to be working for an hour and a half one moment, two hours at the, at the next moment, and again, they've got everyone competing against each other. So this fight over steel is not just about communities and industry, it's about the whole way that our society is run. And in a certain sense, I think that's the reason that the Tories have been forced to even concede 25% nationalisation. It's partly because it's a strategic industry and their prestige is at, at stake, but it's mainly because I think whole layers of the working class understand that <coughs> basic fact and the Tories are under pressure. And when they're under pressure, you've got to drive it home. You don't just um, use it as a negotiating position and get what you can, because 25% is the opening gambit mm. from this uh, government. It's unique because for the first time, since the 70s, the Tory government has called for it, but it's the opening gambit, the same 25% now. But realistically, who the hell is going to want to buy an industry that's losing a million pound a day? Who, who's going to invest in it? Unless they can asset strip it. And therefore, the idea that we should keep the blast furnaces going it is the key demand that, we, that the, the, the community and the other unions are, are taking on board to save that to particular industry. I wanted to, uh, to, to link up as well the issue about how can you make that industry viable? Because you get all sorts of people saying, well, it's losing a million pounds a day. We're not just going to put money, throw money into the furnaces. What are you going to do about that? And of course, the reason it's losing a million pounds a day is because it's paying first world wages and it's competing against, work, uh, against industries who use 
rock bottom cheap labour. That's the reason it's losing money. And it's not because the fault of those workers who have been exploited in China and the rest of the world. It's the fault of the employers and above all the market, which is the race to the bottom. Get the lowest wages going. And that's where it fits in with Jamie's generation as well, because they're trying to drive us all to race to the bottom, to the lowest wages, the lowest conditions, and compete with Chinese workers. And what we have to do, as say, as part of nationalisation, is we take all those industries and we stop the race to the bottom, and we can buy that steel at economic prices and use it for construction, for the, for the car industry, for everything else. But that means taking over other industries as well so that we can stop the race to the bottom and plan our, our society so we can buy steel at a realistic price that will uh, make, those, uh, make those factories, uh, those plants viable, but in a way that also keeps the, the, the standards in our society which are so important to us. <coughs> Going to be the next speaker, but just let me check. Do any of the mirth a lot want to come in? Uh, if you do think about well, I'll just get some catching because it'd be lovely if one of you wanted to. <laughs> Thanks, Mariam. And I think I certainly very much welcome um, Caffili Trace Council's initiative in organising this meeting. As president of Cardiff Trace Council, alongside AJ, um, you know, we really welcome you know new Trace Councils. You know, sort of really uh, punching above their weight. I think in, in terms mm. of that, and I think certainly the platform as well. In terms of you know, these are the comrades. Uh, that we have that you know, I know uh, at my back and, um, and defending working class people in Wales and, and across the, the, the country and I think certainly um, uh, if we had that level of um, dynamism and, and uh, oomph in the Wales TUC, we'd be in a much better place, I think, uh, quite, and the TUC uh, in Congress House as well, we'd be in a much better place. And I think, uh, you know, the points that comrades have made is there is that um, anger in society. It's palpable. People can recognise the Tories are in disarray. They recognise uh, what's going on. They recognise that we should be doing something. Uh, but that leadership is generally not there. And, you know, with the honourable exception of, of some of the unions present here, but also some of our leaders, but some of them are absent as well. And I think it's about how we generate and make that um, very clear in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sort of building that confidence. Uh, I'll plug our May Day demonstration once more because I think you know that's a good opportunity to demonstrate that um, you know trade unions on the streets of Cardiff, to all the shoppers in Cardiff. Chris has spoken uh, on your, I think probably most of you on the platform have spoken at our May Day rally, but I think it's very important uh, when we're celebrating the history of our leaders. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, Bob is no longer here, but you know, it is about the future as well, and that's what he wants to do, that he would have wanted us to do, is fight for a better future for all, but also building up that confidence. So that actually anybody that's hesitant, and that includes everybody in Cardiff Bay as well, who were hesitant, I think the demonstration at Cardiff Trace Council were proud to support the demonstration at but that the Shop Stewards Network called uh, in terms of actually keeping up that pressure because to be honest the, the sort of confidence of workers the willingness to struggle when there is a lead given and PCS in every workplace where we organize uh, you know we have shown that I've seen the National, uh, the, the National Museum of Wales uh, trade unionists and our members in, in, in that group grow in stature in terms of growing confidence in terms of that struggle uh, and I think certainly every time workers enter into action their, their confidence grows and I think certainly it's about how we can make sure that we don't just uh, celebrate uh, the past but also uh, celebrate victories in the future uh, but actually we also you know want to put enough pressure to stop people that aren't willing to fight in terms of fighting and I think certainly the example of public sector workers taking on the bosses, us organising communities and the role of Trace Council in terms of representing workers in the communities and the people using our services in, in the communities is very important in terms of building up that confidence that we can take on the Tories. We also can take on uh, Cardiff Bay as well and I think certainly what we want is to fight for the money we need in Wales, to fight uh, for the um, you know, you know, we know where all the money's gone. <laughs> you know, 
it's all been exposed where the money's gone. 123 billion pounds every year is wasted, you know, isn't uh, paid in tax. That's just probably a small proportion of the money uh, that could be used for public services, for our future, for pay, uh, for the steel industry and so on. Big business could pay that without uh, even noticing, quite frankly, and I think certainly it's raising pe people's expectations. We don't just want little tiny reforms, we don't just want to uh, um, you know, stop a few cuts, we want to stop all the cuts, we can stop all the cuts, we can have the funding in Wales to actually give people a decent future, uh, fight for the industries that we need uh, in, in, in Wales as well. And I think certainly I made the point when I was in Patel, but I'm represent workers in the Department for Work and Pensions. That's one area I don't want any extra work. Because our members do not want to have to deal with 15,000 steel workers on the dole coming into our offices. The cost of that is too great uh, for, the, for Britain, but also the loss of that industry is too great, quite frankly. We, you know, we don't want to be paying out dole money to people that are skilled workers. We need those jobs in our communities. We need the steel in our communities as well. And I think certainly, uh, let's keep on building up that confidence. Put the pressure on the ones that are unwilling to fight because our members are willing to fight. And I think we can, uh, um, you know, I think trades councils are in a very good position to keep arguing that point, keep putting that pressure on. When we go to the Wales TVC in May, <laughs> we are the left uh, wing of that conference. That's why Bob Crow saw our example at that conference. That's why he realised how important trades council were and then argued the point at the TUC to make sure that we get representation at the Trade Union Congress as well. So I think certainly, you know, all the power is in our hands. The Tories are absolutely scared uh, witless of us, but our leaders need to understand that as well. And if they won't understand that, we need new leaders. You're welcome if you want to. Um, all right. If not, then I'm going to ask which of the speakers would like to reply briefly. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll make, we'll make it brief. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah just, just very briefly. Once again, thanks very much for the, uh, the invitation to say this evening. And Bob would be very humble and honoured by this. And um, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's been a fantastic event. Um, just just a couple of. Uh, a couple of comments and lately they said, well, what would we do to change? Well, I answer it quite simply, really. Well, the, the force of change is out there, it's plainly evident. People have had guts full of all this. People aren't willing to tolerate this nonsense anymore. They aren't willing to have their lives wrecked by a capitalist class that's got far more wealth than they'd ever know. Uh, they're not going to tolerate this anymore. But it's clear what we need is we need clear leadership from the trade union movement. And we've got some great unions here, and it's encouraging to see the example that's out there. But the, 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 the TUC in general need to get their act together. They need, to, uh, they need to fight for working class people. And uh, Bob, to answer a question, I think you'd have gone up on a 24 hour strike. You said, let's go out and we sort this mob out, destroy them. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, let's, go all, let's go for it. Because the world's our oyster, that's what, that's what we should have. But people mention the, uh, the trident. Um, and, uh, and I saw an amazing statistic something like 6,000 jobs are connected to trident, but they reckon 40,000 jobs are connected to steel in this country. So it's fine to spend billions and billions of pounds to, 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 to sort of threaten, threaten working class people around the country uh, to, to promote their interests, but you can't save working class people's jobs in this country. It's an absolute outrage. Yeah. And if you look at the austerity, uh, Rob mentioned the figure of one trillion. If you can compare it in terms, if you took one of those persons' mass fortune, these trillionaires out there, you'd solve austerity overnight. I'm not advocating attacking one person, that makes it all fine. Not some people would, actually. Yeah. 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 Give me a list, I might, I might change my mind. <laughs> but but, but that's, the, that's the reality of where we are. Everyone in this country is suffering, and that mob, if you take off one of those people, that would solve this problem overnight. So, once again, thanks so very much for your time for coming today. I would just finish with saying that. Bob is irreplaceable, but history tells you one thing, there'll be other leaders come forward to advocate for the working class people. So never lose sight of that, but ultimately never lose sight of the fact we're all in it together. Oh, that's a terrible <laughs> president. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But the reality, the reality, the reality is, is that collectively, we stand, we, once we stand together, and I think people in this country are gal galvanising behind that now, we're going to take the fight for the stories, and what we're going to do, we're going to make sure steel is saved. Thank you. I wasn't brief, but I, I think 
the question that the, the sister raised about 150,000 people in London last weekend, and where was the media? Yeah? And I think, first, as a, as a trade union movement, we have to use other means of getting our message over. And we are good at that. We are on the streets, we do leaflet, you know, we use Twitter, we use Facebook, we do use other methods, right? And I think is that's the message we have to get over, is what's happening to working class people in our communities. You know, they, they've been attacked by this government and it's the vulnerable, the ones that get attacked. And I think that's, that's the key for us, is getting our message out to the communities. I, I, I mean, I sort of share the, uh, I think the point underlying the question that uh, I, I, we've seen the People's Assembly demonstrations uh, I mean, on a big scale, and I would suggest that marching is important, but I think really the answer to the question is that people will engage if they think the action is going to lead to something. I think, you know, there is a, a real issue. They, 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 I would say the elites have tried to even diminish the impact of marchings, particularly, you know, around the war, that biggest demonstration ever, and yet they went ahead. And the, the advantage to the ruling elites is that it says, we will ignore you even if you go on the streets. So it poses the question of what more can we do? And I think the virtue of this meeting is to start talking very practically about the type of things we can do collectively in communities, in workplaces, through trades councils, linking up the different anti-cops groups, <laughs> and most fundamentally, I think, putting pressure on the TUC to provide the leadership. Now, I would just say on that that yes, we should continue to do it, and PCS does that. I think that there comes a time sometimes where the unions do need to talk independently and develop our own means of discussing those that are serious about organising a fight. In particular, I think there's been a lack of focus and call for supportive action around the junior doctors, for example. I mean, if the employers dare to attack them further, although, as I said, they're wavering, then it would be incumbent on the entire trade union movement to organise, not just to issue press releases, uh, but to talk about it, but to organise a, uh, a collective response. But I think that's what's come over in, in, in most of the contributions. I mean, I'll just make this point that the, the uh, PCS member, Steve, who was giving the talk that I was party to in the big pit, he recounted the situation in the 20s and 30s where he said that, you know, as miners, you turn up at the gate and the owner would, prior to nationalisation, will I'll have you and you, but not you. And there's an expression, I think it was the National Minority Movement, it was organised in the 30s, it used to say, the status of the man at the factory uh, bench is determined, unfortunately, by the status of the man at the factory gate. And the employer knows that. And he was making the comparison with zero hour contracts. He was saying, what has really changed? And as Dave, Jamie and others have said, I mean, all of these struggles are connected because we've seen the decimation of established industries, replaced by the retail and service sector, a fragmentation of production that has made it difficult for the trade union movement to organise and hasn't really grappled with that question. And that's why some of these grassroots campaigns can sometimes act as a lever and a pressure on unions to remember their obligation to organise in, in, in a, more collective, uh, a more collective way. And I think the, the final point I would make is, uh, again, I mean, we live in the seventh richest economy on the planet. You know, there is an abundance of wealth in British society, we know, but it's concentrated in an ever-diminishing, smaller minority. It is always was and always will be a question of economic and political priorities, not the absence of wealth. And I think that's what comes out of this particular discussion. We need to use this to counterpose our own programme around which people can organise. If we set out a vision and an alternative. That's how you win support. That's we find in strikes. If you don't, if you if you fight in any employer, it's about half of the battle is about saying no. We're not accepting these detrimental changes. We know how this could be organised better. We've got an alternative, and it is, and, that, and it comes back to the point that was made about steel. That it's got to be the heart of any regeneration of a manufacturing sector, which a third of which went to the war under Thatcher in the first 10 years of, uh, of, of Thatcher. We need to develop our alternative, and yes, I would say, you've got to look at initiatives 
based on a plan, based on community and public and worker involvement, but also based on public ownership. We've got to look at initiatives, for example, like climate jobs that could create jobs of insulating homes. You've got to look at investing in uh, renewable uh, sectors uh, that can create the much needed skilled uh, jobs. Many people will tell you that it's utopian, it's too costly. Again, I think many people have countered many of the uh, uh, deceptions promoted about the possibilities of creating a genuine new manufacturing sector based on climate jobs. And you won't be able to do that without a steel industry. That's going to be at the heart of it. Is that, that's the point I'm trying to make. Again, half the battle is not just saying no, but what we stand for. Well, yeah, I just want to say obviously thanks to the Caffili Trades Council. Uh, I was a member of Swansea Trades Council, and now a member of Waltham Forest Trades Council in North East uh, London. I mean, just on some of the issues, on this issue of temporary nationalisation actually, I mean the truth is it'd be cheaper to nationalise it permanently then what they're doing, uh, what they would like to do, is find a buyer and then subsidise a private sector buyer to take it over. It's a bit like what happened, you know, if, uh, obviously Steve would remember this, but when they were forced into in effect and renationalise uh, what became Network, uh, Network Green, and the talk is that Blair said to Brown, because it was Labour government at the time, new Labour government at the time. Look, you can call it whatever you like, but just don't use the N word, you know, because they were as ideologically against public ownership as Cameron is uh, right now. And of course, you know, um, Chris mentioned about you know using nationalisation and public ownership. You know, we had the opportunity, don't we, with Royal Mail to use that as a public bank, really, as a you know, uh, and of course we nationalise the banking sector. What do we do? Uh, what did they do with that? And, and uh, East Coast Mainline, you know, that was in effect de facto nationalised because the private sector couldn't run it. Uh, it actually was uh, it didn't use hardly any of the subsidy that the other company, that the private operators used. It actually returned money to the exchequer, and as soon as they possibly could, what did they do? They give it back to uh, Virgin and the company. It was two owners, two, isn't it? Uh, owners who were uh, running it uh, at the uh, at the moment. Um, and it, just a just a couple of points is that you know the, the point about the publicity. Well, uh, you know Bernie Sanders is finally getting some publicity. You know he's had to get like forty thousand people watching him in parts of, uh, of America, because grudgingly now they're putting him on, actually putting him on now to try and say he's been defeated. But that, is, uh, that battle has shaken the establishment in America to the core. Look what's happening in France, by the way. Yeah. Does anyone realise what is taking place in France? Right, that it's not that far away. Uh, it's taking place uh, at the moment. And by the way, that will absolutely terrify them. The idea that we could have a mass struggle in France uh, we'll, uh, we'll be t we'll keeping them all awake uh, every night uh, of the week. And again, just on this People's Assembly demonstration, don't forget though, sometimes we'll be so close to the action and don't realise what has taken place in a very brief period. On March 26, 2011, it was estimated that 750,000 trade unionists marched uh, on that TUC organised uh, demonstration. But of course we shouldn't forget, on November the 30th that year, two million workers in the public sector marched against the attack on, uh, on pensions. That was a huge opportunity <coughs> to, defeat the Tories, to defeat the Tories. Obviously, Chris's uh, uh, union were in the forefront of trying to get that action on and trying to maintain that action. Unfortunately, some of the trade union leaders uh, with the TUC, with Sir Brendan Barber, couldn't wait to call that action off, and that action has emboldened the Tories because the truth is those trade union leaders either wouldn't or couldn't understand this wasn't just another struggle, this is a fundamental attack. These people are trying to turn the clock back 90 years and therefore you can't oppose that through clever negotiation. It has to be a full frontal assault uh, against them and of course that is the issue then, you know, it was great the People's Assembly demo last Saturday, but there's no need
for the trade unions to subcontract out the struggle to a, an organisation that they largely finance uh, as well. You know, we don't want trade union leaders <coughs> speaking on platform as guests. We want them up there saying, what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do next? And take the action. I've been involved, actually, personally, uh, with the junior doctors and the teachers in, in London uh, to, you know, to, to get the and build support for the demonstration they're calling uh, next uh, Tuesday, which I could think would be very good. Just last couple of points on the issue of steel. Actually, this would be a struggle that could really bring together loads and loads of people. I can remember in 1892 when they tried to close the rest of the pits, and there were two demonstrations in London of a of quarter of a million in five days of each other that had the potential to have defeated the Tories. But I also make this appeal as well. The you know, to the Labour councillors, Jeremy Corbyn was elected last year on an anti-austerity programme. We should have a united front of those Labour councillors refusing to implement and pass oh, on yeah. any more <laughs> You see this statistic, right? It's actually, it's estimated some like 19,000 jobs uh, are caught up in trade. And, and the trade union leaders, the Labour affiliated unions, uh, and I'm going to go put a pressure on Corbyn. We've got to do something. We can't let those jobs uh, go. There's 40,000 with the steel industry. And again, the Labour affiliated unions, rightly, I think they should be stronger on nationalisation, but I'm fighting for those workers. That's great. Half a million public sector jobs have gone. And I do not see those trade union leaders going to Jeremy and John saying, tell those councillors not to implement any more uh, cuts. So we should be saying to these people, when the Tories are on the ropes, you should be opposed to them and fighting with the trade unions yeah. you represent in, uh, in this kind of... The last shameless plug on July the 2nd is the yeah. National Shop Stewards Network's 10th annual conference. Can you believe it? In July the 2nd, and they're all welcome to come up. But the people who will be in that meeting <coughs> will be people like yourselves. Again, grappling with these tasks and what can we do to defeat the Tories, to make the victories count, and to bring down, you know, the gov this hated uh, government and open up new opportunities for the Labour and Trade Union movement. This event is going to be a yearly event, an annual event. I think it's excellent that we put Bob Crow's name on it because his is exactly the kind of fighting trade unionism that we want to build and, and promote and, and be part of. Um, but it's always going to be about whatever struggles are taking place at that time. And uh, please be part of uh, building that with us. I'm very grateful to you all for coming. And let's go take the fight forward together. So thanks. To the